This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast. This is episode number 15, or should we say step number 15 on the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Welcome. If you have been a long-time listener, thank you so much. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Actually, today I am not on the homestead. I am actually at my day job. And so if you hear a bit of a a buzz or a whine in the background, I apologize for that. This is not the optimal place to do a podcast, Um, but I am at work uh, on this beautiful Saturday doing some uh, system changes. And so I figured I would uh, use the time wisely and record the podcast from here since I got here at about five o'clock this morning and don't anticipate leaving until about midnight tonight. So in for a long day. Um, and so anyhow, thank you again for joining us, joining us on the uh, homestead journey. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully the wine of the server room that's right behind me is not too overwhelming. So what's been going on on 3B Farm and Homestead this week? Well, this week I spent uh, the first half of the week, actually the majority of the week, uh, completing that bathroom remodel that I have been talking about that we started about 10 months ago. And I finally got back to that, put up the ceiling, got the crown molding installed, got everything uh, painted, and it looks very, very nice. Now, let me tell you something. It is certainly not perfect. <laughs> After all, I did it. I'm an IT guy by trade. Um, but as they say, caulk and paint will make a carpenter what he ain't. And uh, so I certainly lived up to that. I learned some things. And, and unfortunately, when you do projects like this, sometimes you learn things the hard way, um, but in ways that you can't always easily go back and make corrections and who knows if I'll remember these lessons the next time I do something like this, which hopefully won't be for a very, very long time. But we used beadboard on the ceiling, and uh, it had been sitting in my basement, <clears throat> actually in my garage for, I, I don't know, probably eight or nine months. Um, I bought it shortly after we started the project. And I should have brought it upstairs and let it, I guess the term is normalize. Um, we have a pellet stove which dries things out. And I did not do that. So when I put the beadboard up, I had everything really nice and tight. And my thought was, this is a composite product. It's not going to move. It's not going to shrink too much. Well, I was very, very wrong on that. Um, I ended up with some like eighth inch or quarter inch cracks actually at the butt joints. So I had to use some wood putty um, to, uh, to fill those in. And I hope that that will hold up. That was the recommended course of action. Initially, I was just going to caulk it. But uh, everything I read said don't caulk it. And in fact, on the caulking tube itself, it said not for butt joints. So uh, I did some research. They said use wood putty, which is what I did. And by and large, it came out very, very nice. Uh, I am just very glad that this project is over. But uh, I do think that as homesteaders, um, with our desire to be more self-sufficient, more self-reliant, Um, we're going to have a tendency sometimes to jump into projects like this. And uh, sometimes it feels like you've bitten off a little bit more than you can chew. But when you get to the other side, it is definitely rewarding. But trust me, I don't want to do another one of these for a long time. (laughs) So uh, other things that have been going on on the homestead this week, I actually um, registered for a charcuterie class, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, This is taking place over at... uh, Timber Lost Farm, I believe is the name of it, over in uh, New Hampshire, a little over two hour drive from where I live. Um, And this is through the American Guinea Hog Association, uh, or in partnership with the American Guinea Hog Association. Um, But Meredith Lee is the uh, one that is doing this um, 
uh, class, she actually has authored a couple of books, one called Pure Charcuterie, The Craft and Poetry of Curing Meats at Home, and another one called The Ethical Meat Handbook. Um, and from my understanding, uh, she actually at one point in time was a uh, vegetarian and then had gone full on vegan. Um, but while she was traveling overseas, uh, somebody served her some water buffalo and it really got her to thinking about, you know, making ethical choices with regards to meats. And uh, so anyhow, I'm looking so forward to this class on charcuterie. We're going to be breaking down an American guinea hog from um, Timber Haven Farm. Um, and so just very, very excited about that. And I will be doing a podcast on my takeaways uh, from the uh, class. This is going to be taking place the end of March. So excited about that. Um, the other thing that I found this week is that my local library in um, conjunction with the local um, agricultural stewardship association is putting on um, a screening of the film Farmsteaders, which actually I've not really looked into it too much, uh, but very excited about uh, going to see that. That's going to be coming up this week, and they're going to have a discussion afterwards. And so I'm really interested in going as much for the discussion afterwards as I am for the uh, film itself. But if you've seen that film, um, let me know what your thoughts were on it. It's called Farmsteaders. Um, today, uh, while again sitting here at the, uh, at the desk here at work, um, I have also spent some time organizing my seeds in preparation for springtime. Uh, in, and I don't remember exactly which episode it was, I shared a homestead hack with you with regards to using a toolbox as a means of storing seeds. And that worked well for me, except that my toolbox well, it was rather, I wouldn't say, but it was just too small. <laughs> and so my wife saw the issues I was having, and instead of buying me a larger toolbox for this, she actually bought a, um, it's called a, a photo and craft organizer uh, box. And it actually has inside it a bunch of about seed packet size little plastic pouches. Um, and I put pictures of it up on our Instagram page if you want to jump over there and take a look at that. Um, but they really seem to fit well in there. And the thing I like about it is that if I want to uh, get, let's say, my tomatoes out, I can pull them out and take that small little plastic piece with me and everything else is going to stay nice and organized. And uh, so I'm going to try this out and see how things go, and I will keep you posted. But right now, very, very happy with that. But jump over to Instagram and take a look at that. I also posted a picture to our Facebook page, but on Instagram has the various uh, pictures of exactly how the thing goes together. And uh, so I've got that all sorted out. And hopefully today, as I'm sitting here at the desk, I will get my seed order completed and... Uh, because now I know exactly what I have on hand. So that's very exciting. The last thing that I wanted to talk about with regards to our homestead happenings is we are going to be making some, I, don't wanna, I guess we could, we could say big changes <laughs> uh, on our homestead this month on, on kind of a trial basis. While we do eat relatively healthy and uh, we try to eat as much of the, the food that we raise as possible, we have not, up to this point, gone full-on organic. We've not gone full-on non-processed foods, you know, all of those kinds of things. It's It's been a, you know, we're going to try to do the best we can, but um, we still eat processed foods like, you know, Doritos and um, cereals and, you know, my wife uses, um, you know, conventional soups and whatnot. Um, in, in cooking and, and just all of those kinds of things. Well, this month, in, in the month of February, what our goal is, is to just do a trial where we're going to cut back on the amount of white sugar that we consume and we are going to try to seriously minimize, if not totally avoid during the month of February, processed foods. Um, and when I say processed foods, I'm talking about the, the stuff that you buy at the store that you can't pronounce the ingredients in. Um, now, we have certain foods that we have processed ourselves, 
uh, tomatoes, sauces, and, and, and those kinds of things. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about processed foods that you would buy at the store that have those names that are like, you know, 400 letters long. <laughs> uh, I can't pronounce them. Um, I, I, I'm not sure there's quite, well, too many people that can pronounce some of those words. So anyhow, um, we felt like in the month of February, uh, it would be a good time for us to do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a shorter month, so it's a shorter commitment. Um, secondly, it's also a month in which our son, who is 14, no, he's 15. Man, I cannot figure this out. Last week, I think I said he was 16. He's 15. Our son, who is 15, is going to be spending 10 days uh, in Costa Rica and Panama on a school trip. And so we felt like this was a great month for us to make this uh, change just because for those 10 days he's not going to be impacted by it. And I know some of you may be saying, well, it's a good change. And, and yes, it is. But it's also, to a certain extent, it's a bit of a drastic change. And so we want to pilot it. We want to try it out. We want to see how things go um, and then see whether or not we feel any health benefits and so on and so forth from it. Um, I already actually about two weeks ago cut out, I um, drink a lot of coffee and a lot of coffee. I love coffee. Um, but I usually have sugar and creamer in my coffee. And when I say creamer, here at work they don't have, uh, they provide us with all kinds of free coffee. The sugar is there, but the creamer is that powdery crap. And uh, so I, I was putting that in my coffee. So anyhow, about a week and a half or two weeks ago, I just cut it out. And I've been drinking my coffee black since then. And so it's just kind of things like that that we're going to be doing on the homestead and in our life. Uh, and see, you know, does it make us feel any better? How, how does, you know, how do, how do our bodies react? And uh, so I'll be jumping on the scale today uh, and taking a measurement, so to speak. And uh, then at the end of the month, we will see how we look. Anyhow. Uh, oh, one other thing. As part of that, I actually did go ahead and order Jill Wingert's uh, cookbook that is focused on homestead cooking. And so looking very much forward to uh, trying out those recipes and also availing ourselves of her Facebook group that has a lot of great information in it. And so periodically throughout this month, I will be providing you with updates on how things are going. But uh, that's what's been happening on 3B Farm and Homestead this week. All right, it is time for this episode's Charting the Course. So you want to get animals on your homestead, or maybe you've had live livestock for a while, but you're considering adding other animals to your homestead. Where do you start? What should you get? What are some things you should consider when getting animals on your homestead. That's what we're going to be talking about on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. For most homesteaders, eventually livestock is going to become part of the equation. Um, I think that for most homesteads, I'm not going to say all homesteads, but for most homesteads, I think that you can raise and grow at least some of your own meat or raise an animal that's going to provide you with eggs and so on and so forth. Now, for some people, you're going to have to get creative. If you're in an urban homestead or if you're on a, on a suburban homestead, if you live in an HOA, then uh, you may have to get creative in order to be able to do this. But I do think that for most homesteaders, eventually livestock is going to be a part of your homestead journey. Now again, like I said, for people who live in HOAs or urban areas, creativity is going to be key. I shared with you several episodes ago about uh, someone who I had uh, I saw a post from them on, I believe it was Facebook, uh, where they wanted to have chickens, but they lived in an area where they couldn't have chickens. And so um, this guy got creative and he was raising quail in an aquarium in his living room. Now that may not work for you. <laughs> your wife may say, no way, Jose. Your husband may say, no way, Jose. But there are other creative aspects or other creative ways that you might be able to 
accomplish something like that. I read about another family who um, wanted to have chickens and the HOA said no. And so they were raising rabbits in cages on their back porch. Going a little rogue there, but getting creative and raising and growing some of their own meat. So I think for most homesteaders, eventually livestock is going to become a part of the, the equation, uh, part of your homestead journey. And so what are some things that you should consider when buying animals or adding animals to your homestead? On this episode, we're going to consider five things I think that you should consider when either getting animals for the first time or adding additional animals to your homestead. The first thing I think you need to consider are your resources. Animals are not cheap. <laughs> As they, this kind of is a, a saying that people jokingly say, the bigger the animal, the bigger the bills. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so certainly as you are thinking about adding uh, animals to your homestead, consider how much money you have to put into this endeavor. Because not only are you going to need to have finances in order to be able to buy the animals, but you need to consider feed costs. You need to consider uh, the cost that's going to, you're, you're going to incur in providing um, some kind of housing for them, maybe fencing that you're going to need to put up, uh, cages you need to buy, other infrastructure that you need to invest in. Um, and none of that is cheap. Now, there are certainly ways that you can cut costs with regards to putting in infrastructure, but you definitely want to make sure you have the right infrastructure in place for the type of animal that you are purchasing. Because if you try to put pigs, for example, in a dog kennel, um, that's probably not going to work out really well. Um, here locally, we actually, there was a big kerfuffle not too long ago where somebody was trying to raise uh, a calf in a in, in a dog kennel. When I talk about a dog kennel, I'm talking about one of those six by six chain link fence dog kennels. Um, if you try to put pigs in those, they're going to bust right through. You try to put, uh, um, you know, a calf in that, you, people aren't going to be very happy with you. <laughs> so you definitely need to make sure you have the right infrastructure in place and in, invest in the proper infrastructure in which to raise these animals. So consider your resources. Consider how much time you have um, to put into this because, again, well, there are certain things that you can do to minimize the amount of direct time that you have to invest in caring for your animals. You certainly are not, um, by and large, going to be a, on a set it and forget it kind of, of thing. Your animals are going to need to be fed. They're going to need to be watered. They're going to need to be cared for. And so how much time do you have to put into doing something like that? Does your job, um, is your job conducive to that? Whereby you can um, invest the proper time into the care for your animals. You certainly don't want to buy animals, bring them onto your homestead, and then neglect them. We're wanting to do right by our animals, right? That's kind of the whole point of this, is to make sure that they only have one bad day. And folks, things aren't always going to be perfect, but you certainly want to make sure that you have the time necessary to put into that. And not only that, but you also need to consider that when you have animals, it's going to impact the vacations you can take, the places you can go, um, because you're going to need to make sure that you either have systems in place whereby your animals are fed and watered when you're gone, or you have people that can come and feed and water and care for your animals when you're gone. Consider the amount of space that your animals are going to need. Um, if you have a small urban backyard or a small suburban backyard, you're probably not going to have room enough for a family milk cow, right? So you need to consider the space that you have available uh, in order to make sure that you are buying the right animal for your homestead. So the first thing to consider is to consider the resources you have available. The second thing you need to consider are your skills. When you have animals, animals are going to become sick. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You can do your best to keep them healthy, 
to, to feed them a very nutritious diet, to give them proper shelter, to give them adequate uh, water and all of those things and eventually your animals are going to get sick. In fact, a friend of mine says if you have livestock, you're eventually going to have dead stock. Now, that's a bit dramatic, but it is true. And so do you have either the skills to be able to uh, provide care to your animals? Um, do you have the, uh, we want to say the stomach for that? Um, you know, does the site, at the sight of blood, are you going to faint? <laughs> so you need to understand your skills. Um, one thing is for sure, unless you are independently wealthy, uh, you're not going to be able to rush your animals to the vet every time they have an issue. You know, if you were raising chickens, for example, it's one of the things I, I, I sometimes chuckle about on uh, some of the, the Facebook um, groups and, and even on BackyardChickens.com where somebody will post a question with regards to a chicken being sick and people are like, well, you should take it to the vet. Folks, unless you are raising show quality birds or you're independently wealthy, most of us cannot afford to run our chickens to the vet every time there's an issue. It just simply doesn't make economic sense. And so do you have the skills or are you willing to learn the skills whereby you are learning animal husbandry to be able to take care of your animals? But not just that. Are you handy? Are you going to be able to build or install the infrastructure that your animals are going to need, whether it's housing, whether it's fencing? Um, and if not, do you have the resources, going back to considering your resources, do you have the resources necessary to be able to have somebody come do that for you? If you are raising the animals for meat, do you know how to butcher animals? And if not, are you willing to learn? Or if you're not willing to learn, do you have a place nearby whereby you can take the animals and have them processed? And if you're going to go that route, again, going back to resources, do you have the money available to be able to do that? Do you have the equipment available to you to be able to transport the animals? These are all things that you need to consider, in my opinion, before you get animals. So if you're going to raise chickens for meat, do you know how to butcher them? Do you have a plucker? Do you have kill cones? If not, are you willing to invest in those? Do you have somebody nearby that has those things that you can borrow or a place nearby where you can take the chickens and have them processed? If you're raising pigs, are you going to process them yourself or and do you have that skill set or are you going to have to take them somewhere and have them processed and do you have a trailer that you can load those pigs into or a, a crate that you can put onto the back of your truck whereby you can transport those pigs and have them processed. So you need to consider your skills uh, before you buy your animals. So not only should con you consider your resources and consider your skills, but you also need to consider your goals. Why are you getting your animals? You know, sometimes people jump into getting animals just because everybody else has them. But why are you getting them? Why are you getting pigs? Why are you getting chickens? Why are you getting goats? What are you going to do with these animals? Unfortunately, sometimes people buy all of these animals, and, and, and especially people that are new to homesteading, but even people who are a little bit more on the veteran side, they jump into it and they buy all the animals, and then what ends up happening is they get a little too attached. And so the turkey that they were raising for Thanksgiving ends up becoming the farm mascot. Um, the uh, the pig that they were raising for pork chops ends up uh, becoming the family pet. And you can only do that so many times, folks, before your feed bill gets incredibly crazy. So you need to understand what you're going to be doing with those animals so that you can prepare yourself mentally uh, and also to make sure that you're buying the right animal for the quote-unquote job. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to buy, um, let's say, leggerns as your your breed of chicken if your plan is to also 
dress them off for meat. Because leghorns, while they're a great egg laying animal, are not, there's not a lot of meat on them, their bones. <laughs> <laughs> and while you certainly can process, process them and eat them, and we do, but if my goal was to have a dual purpose animal where I'm raising them for both meat and for eggs, a leghorn is probably not going to be the best choice. So you need to consider your goals. What am I going to do with these animals? Also think about how they fit within your approach to homesteading. Uh, again, thinking about your homestead journey from kind of a long-term perspective, uh, how do these animals fit within that? Are you going to be able to use the outputs from these animals as, as an input to another process? So, for example, you may raise rabbits, and you don't want to raise them for food, but you want to raise them because their manure is great for the garden. And so they fit into your approach to homesteading, not necessarily as a food source, but as a, for, as, as a source of nutrients for your garden. So how do these animals fit within your approach to homesteading? One of the things that we're trying to do on our homestead, as much as possible, as much as it makes sense, is to focus on raising heritage breed animals, and in particular, American heritage breed animals. So as we add animals to livestock to our homestead, my goal is to focus on raising animals that might be on the critical or the endangered list according to the Livestock Conservancy. So while well, last year we had Emden geese on our homestead and we still have them, as we add geese to our homestead, my goal is to bring in geese that are threatened or endangered. And right now I'm looking at bringing in cotton patch geese to our homestead because they're in need of help with recovery. And what kind of got me thinking about that were our American guinea hogs. I got the American guinea hogs in part because they were a breed in need of help. And so if I can do that where it makes sense on my homestead, I want to do that because that fits within my approach, my philosophy of homesteading. That may not be your approach to homesteading. That may not be your philosophy, and that's okay. But understand how your animals, these animals you're going to add to your homestead, fit within your goals. If you're bringing in goats, are you trying to do that for meat, or are you trying to do that for milk? You know, or are you trying to do it for both? So, again, consider your goals. So not only should you consider your resources, consider your skills and consider your goals, but you also need to consider your options. You see, one, one of the things I, I see all the time, I shouldn't say all the time, but I see a lot, is people will say about a particular breed, it's the perfect homestead whatever, the perfect homestead chicken, the perfect homestead pig, the perfect homestead cow, the perfect homestead turkey, the perfect homestead whatever. Folks, that does not exist. At least in my opinion, it does not exist. It may be perfect for some homesteads. It may be perfect for other homesteads, but it's not perfect for every homestead. Again, going back to the fact that some people live in areas where you may not be able to have chickens. So how can something be the perfect homestead chicken if you're not even allowed to have chickens in the first place? You see what I'm saying? So there, in my opinion, there is no perfect homestead animal. There certainly is no perfect homestead breed. But you need to think about those things if you are going to add a animal to your, to your homestead. Think about the breeds that are available. Think about their characteristics. Think about their tendencies. Because you want to make sure that you're getting the animal that is right for your situation. If you are raising pigs, but you only want to, you want to get pigs in the spring and you want to butcher them off in the fall, which many, many people do, and there's nothing wrong with that approach, getting a slow growing breed like the American guinea hog, which I absolutely love. And in the next, I'm not sure if the next episode, but in an upcoming episode, I'm going to be talking about the American guinea hog and why we chose it as our homestead pig, but that's not going to be the right breed for you. 
it's not it's not going to fatten up fast enough. It's a slow growing pig. So if that's your goal, then that's not the right breed for you. Again, going back to the the uh, the chicken, uh, if you're thinking about a dual purpose breed, the Leghorn is not going to be a good option for you. So consider your options. Consider the breeds that are available, but make sure that you get good stock. Don't just go buy the first goats that you find on Craigslist or the first chickens you find um, at an auction. You want to make sure that if you are investing in animals, that you are investing in good stock. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be purebred. It doesn't necessarily mean that it mean, needs to be the most expensive ones out there. And in fact, if you are new to a particular style of a particular type of animal, you may want to go with just general run of the mill stock. For example, last year I was new to geese. So I got Emdens because Emdens are very common. Therefore, they're relatively cheap. Now, I tried to get them from a reputable hatchery, but I didn't go looking for show winning, award winning geese that were going to cost me a lot of money because if I made a mistake and let's face it folks when you're new to an animal new to a, a, a you know the, the care of an animal you're going to make mistakes and sometimes unfortunately when you make those mistakes animals die and so I didn't want to waste money on buying incredibly expensive stock and then having the geese die because of some mistake of mine or because you know, I didn't provide them with adequate predator protection and the hawks got them or whatever. But now that I've had a go with geese and I uh, now I'm thinking about, OK, I, I kind of get geese, I'm not an expert one year. OK, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. But now I'm starting to think about, OK, what direction do I want to go with geese? And now I'm kind of leaning towards the cotton patch goose. The same way with turkeys. Last year was our first year with turkeys. We got broad-breasted whites, very common breed. My thought process was, if things don't go right, at least I've not wasted a lot of money on an expensive breed of turkey. Now that we've had turkeys, kind of got a feel for what turkeys do, we're leaning towards either getting white hollands or getting um, royal palms. So you want to get good stock, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the best stock is my point. I was just listening to uh, the Pastured Pig podcast um, from Red Tool House, and Troy was talking about how he, when they got into raising pigs, he just bought the first pigs he ran across on Craigslist. And he started a breeding program, and he was trying to bring in, he was doing artificial insemination, and so he was trying to get good um, semen from a reputable supplier, but what he found is that he was fighting bad genetics from the get-go. And so recently he got rid of all of his pigs and he brought in good genetics because if you don't start with good stock and you want to establish a breeding program, you're not going to end up with great results. So consider your options breed-wise, understanding that there is no right animal, there's no right first animal, and make sure that you get good stock. The final thing I think you want to consider when getting animals is you need to consider their needs in every season you'll be raising them. You know, right now a lot of people are focused on pasture and grass-fed animals, and that's great, but that doesn't necessarily work for everybody. I live in the Northeast. You know, I'm in beautiful upstate New York. Pasture and grass fed is pretty much not an option for us for about six months out of the year. Now, certainly you can get hay, but there's an expense to that. But it, people, when they think about pasture raised and grass fed, they're thinking about these rotational, uh, you know, rotational grazing and so forth. For us, that's not an option unless you put an incredible amount of money into establishing infrastructure. But if you're going to be, if you think you're going to be rotationally grazing chickens with you know, with with poultry netting in the Northeast, that that's not going, that's not going to work. 
So you need to think about in the winter when I cannot have my chickens on grass and I cannot rotate them around, what am I going to do with them? In the winter when I cannot rotate my pigs around with uh, poultry, or not poultry, but pig netting, what am I going to do with them? You need to consider that. You need to consider the shelters that the animals are going to need. What, a shelter that might work in the summertime might not work in the wintertime. I see some people who have really awesome ideas with regards to mobile chicken coops. And I'm not going to call these, these mobile chicken coops out by, by name, but many of those mobile chicken coops would not be an option for me in the Northeast. There's two, they would be way too drafty for my chickens in 10 degree below zero weather. So the shelter needs are going, can vary from season to season. The other thing to think about is water. <laughs> water in the winter is a pain in the butt. Now, if you live in Florida, you don't deal with this. If you live in Alabama, you don't deal with this like we do up here. But in the winter, water can be an absolute pain in the keister. And so if you don't have um, a frost-free hydrant and you don't want to put the money into or you don't have the money to invest in running a frost-free hydrant, you're going to be somehow carting water out to your animals during the winter. You need to think about that. Folks, it's not a lot of fun. It's something that we do in the Northeast, like I said, about six months out of the year. You're carting water because the big waterers, nipple waterers that the pigs have, that the chickens have, simply do not work when it's 32 degrees or below. They don't work. So you need to think about the needs of your animals in every season that you'll be raising them. Because again, now you're going to be getting into additional costs. You may be getting into additional costs from the standpoint of infrastructure. You may be getting into additional costs with regards to the standpoint of waterers and feed, all of those kinds of things. Consider that before you bring those animals onto your homestead. So the five things you need to consider when getting animals, whether these are your first animals or you've been raising livestock for a while and you're bringing new animals onto your homestead. Consider your resources, time, money, space. Consider your skills. Consider your goals. Consider your options. There's no right breed. There's no right first animal. But always make sure you get good stock. And finally, consider the needs of your animals during every season you'll be raising them. If you consider these five things, I think it will help you make wise decisions as you venture into livestock on your homestead journey. So what other things do you think should be considered when adding animals to the homestead? I'd love to hear from you. Contact me at thehomesteadjourneypodcast at gmail.com or you can contact us via Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. The links to all of our social media accounts are in the show notes. A big thank you to audionautics.com for the music that we use on the podcast and a big thanks to you for joining us on the homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.